Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Jen. I work at Take Two, which is Berry Street's therapeutic statewide service for babies, children and young people who have suffered developmental trauma. Um, this afternoon we're going to try something different and we're going to do a bit of a video interview with Tony Heron, who also works at Take Two. Hi Tony, could you um, introduce yourself and explain who you are? Sure, sure. Um, hi Jen. Um, so I'm my name is Tony Heron, and I'm an occupational therapist, psychotherapist, um, working here at Take Two Berry Street. Have been here for quite a while now, about twelve years. And prior to that, worked in um, child and adolescent mental health settings around around the place in Victoria and New South Wales. And um, have always really worked with children, adolescents and their families, because I love it, basically. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And sorry, can I just say, and the carers, sorry, not only families, but the carers as well. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Which segues us nicely to what we're going to talk about today. So we've been doing a few resources for carers, for parents, for caregivers of all types. And today I wanted to ask you some questions about self-regulation in children, particularly self-regulating bodies uh, for children. Um, so I want to start with some basics and um, ask you, by what do we mean by regulation or self-regulation? Mm. Well, it's, it's essentially being able to settle our minds and our bodies so that we can function as well as we can. So by settling, I mean by being able to be calm enough to think and to relate and to make good choices. Fantastic. Um, why is it important that we do learn to regulate our bodies? Well, all of us experience um, times of feeling anxious, um, of being worried or sad or whatever. We all have a range of emotions throughout the day and that's all being part of being human. But if we're wanting to be able to manage to make some you know, good decisions in our lives and function at the best we can and you know, be able to work well and play well and live well um, and love well, we, we need to be able to regulate our emotions so that things like our anxiety um, and terrible sadness, et cetera, don't get totally out of hand so that we can't function. Um, and we all have to learn how to do it. It's, it's part of the human condition. Mm. So typically uh, through a person's development from conception, I'm thinking, all the way through to adulthood, how would self-regulation develop? Well, after a baby is born, essentially, you know, for a long period of time, because babies are born so dependent on their carers, their, their parents and their carers for survival, essentially, uh, initially, and then, um, you know, as nurture and, and safety, that they really Need, it's really not really self-regulation in the beginning, it's actually co-regulation so that the infant learns about regulation through what their parents do and carers do with them. So if a baby, and, and babies by, by definition really, are born with very um, uh, volatile and responsive systems so that they are quite reactive. They're reactive to temperature and they're reactive to hunger and they're reactive to to feeling uncomfortable in their in in their body in space if they move too quickly, um, and so there's a lot of a great need for their carers' capacity to be watching, being attuned, and to respond um, to the baby's state, if you like, so that we can help the baby's calm. Um, to a state where they're actually functioning well. So it's not really self-regulation in the beginning. It becomes that um, over time, but um, it's learning through taking in what the parents and carers have, have to offer them in terms of keeping them warm and safe and loved and, and their bodies kind of calm and held. And also when and none of us feel calm all the time. So, and babies particularly don't, they, they let us know very clearly uh, and quickly sometimes uh, that they're they're very something so they're very hungry or they're very tired or they're very um, pooey or they've got you know, <laughs> they've got a lot of wee in their nappy but, but it's pretty very it's it's an intensity to their response which to their uh, their actions which really demands a response from a from an adult so 
the adults around them really need to be quite attuned and and part of that attunement is through language and eye eye contact but a lot a, a very big part of their um regulating of the baby is through touch um touch is kind of is the first sensory pathway that is primed um in an infant it's uh, it's the biggest one, actually, because it covers a huge surface area of our body, both externally and internally in terms of our organs. So getting back to the question about um, why do we need to learn to regulate our bodies, we kind of need to because we can't. Initially, we actually can't do that. It's something that babies are not born to do. Um, uh, and some children, because of adversity, et cetera, et cetera, struggle to do that throughout their lives and in fact in reality when anyone whether you're a, a pretty calm sort of adult and reasonably well adapted if you are put through enough strain um, big strains throughout your life there are usually periods of dysregulation um, which is part of also of the human condition so um, it's 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 a skill that we need to learn to adapt to live in our worlds essentially um, and initially we need, we need, and for a long time, we need a lot of support from the people around us who love us, the adults in our lives. Mm. Thanks. Um, so you talked then a little bit about adversity in childhood and how that can be a bit of a barrier to learning how to regulate your body. Are there other reasons that some children might struggle to regulate their bodies? Mm. Uh, so it can also, well, adversity is broad, but it also can be to do with with some of the things that children are born with. Um, so that depend children who are born with congenital conditions or um, neurodevelopmental disorders um, often have very have more sensitive uh, brains that aren't quite as adaptive to change and to and to challenge as another baby's brain, essentially. So it can be things that are inside our bodies and it can be things that are outside our bodies happening in the world or in the people around us. So uh, there are many, and it, and sorry, I don't want to say that stress is a bad thing either because um, we all need it. You know, if we don't have some, if we don't learn um, how to manage some optimal level of stress, we're never going to develop any resilience. So it's a kind of a good enough amount of stress we're talking about, whereas here with um, with um, needing to self-regulate, I'm talking about situations that are just overwhelm a, a baby system, basically. So, And they can be internal things. They can be um, chronic illnesses and they can be um, genetic um, syndromes as well as the adversities that can happen through hunger, poverty, abuse, neglect, etc. Okay, thank you. Um, so we know that children in out of home care generally have more trouble regulating their bodies than their age typical peers do at school or in other circumstances. Why is that? Hmm, it's a really good question. There are a number of reasons. Um, one one of them is that. And this is an interesting one, actually, because this is also linked to body contact um, that or can be that children have learned at a very early age as infants that that part of their parents and carers response is to use the combination of sensory inputs through touch, um, eye contact, et cetera, but but all together as a package, if you like. But the touch part, the very firm firm touch and the rocking are two very important sensory inputs that parents and carers do automatically, which actually is something the child has a lived experience of being settled. They actually know what it's like to have a settled body. Um, a lot of our children um, that we work with have not actually had that experience. They have not actually really probably ever learnt to really feel contained by their, their parent or carer um, through the, the whole experience of the, the settling down, calming down. Um, so, for so, and this is not just from uh, uh, children who have had hard things, you know, done to them or near them. It's also children who've missed out on a great deal of, of um, sensory stimulation and also um, things they need that the nourishment um, and cleanliness and um, warmth, the, the basics that we all need to thrive. So one of the things about that whole earlier piece is that children, a lot of our children we work with have learnt sadly that 
for all sorts of reasons, it's been really hard for them to rely on their carers around them to meet their needs. So one of the things when children are, when they had the experience of being loved in that kind of complete body-mind way, um, they kind of feel confident that if they do have a need, whether it be for um, nurturance or comfort or whatever it might be, that they can reach out. But for a lot of our children, they uh, have have learnt not to, not to ask for all sorts of different reasons. So it's a double-edged thing for them. On the one hand, they have not had the experience, they don't know what it's like, and they don't really even know how to ask. And the other thing is they actually haven't had those um, experiences over and over again of being, of having their carer and parent um, care for them physic physically as well as um, in other ways so that their bodies had that experience of being held and I mean held in the physical sense but of being calm from that distraught feeling that babies have when they're absolutely you know beside themselves with hunger or fatigue or whatever that the parent is able to help them learn in their bodies what it feels like to be calmed by a safe other does that make sense Jen to you it does. It does. Thank you. It does. So there are many children uh, in our community who will be suffering the result of never having been held, as you say, mm -hmm. and maybe quite a bit older than babies now. Are there mm -hmm. things that caregivers can do and potentially while they're at home now from school might be a good opportunity to do some more of this work? to try and regulate children by regulating their bodies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a, um, yes, it's a, it's a, a journey that children can learn with the carers uh, together in a sense, because what I've uh, I found working with families around these issues and speaking with caregivers is that um, when caregivers are able to identify uh, the 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 things that calm their children, yeah. Because most of our kids um, actually need calming more than prepping up in in take two. Some some children don't, but it's it's more the minority really. So the the thing around this is actually um, helping the children. One of the things is helping them develop a greater range of healthy soothing strategies. Because all of us have got soothing strategies, you know, some of them aren't so healthy, like, you know, for, for example, I've just had a biscuit for after my lunch today, it was not the healthiest thing in the world, though I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, it's a really good time, actually, because apart from anything else, the children are home with the carers, they're actually being together, seeing, seeing each other, eating together, um, doing things together in a way that most busy families don't get the opportunity. So it's a chance for the for the carers to be, if you like, a, an observer um, and a participant with the child to to talk with the children and to observe what their bodies do. Carers are amazingly good at at, at um, noticing things like, oh, my little my little Johnny that I that lives with me, he likes to walk or walk down the street doing handstands, you know, um, and. Carers, many carers have said to me, people think, oh, yeah, that's a bit interesting, but they're just used to it. That that child needs movement. So working out what the child's body needs, yeah, and trying to meet those needs in a safe way. When I say safe, I mean broadly speaking, because some kids need to have things that are on the margins of safety and risk, <laughs> you know, um, to explore. But um, it's a chance for them to get to, get to know the children's um, the way they use their bodies better, actually, because they're seeing more of them. So I don't mean to idealise this at all. It's a really hard time, but there might be some benefits um, in that experience as well. So would you mind perhaps um, just talking me through some examples of what you might do with a toddler who needs calming down as opposed to maybe a primary schooler and maybe an, uh, an early high schooler? try and calm them down some of the things that people could be trying at sure. home sure okay so this of course depends on what the what the home environment's like and hopefully the child the toddler has some space um, <laughs> but you know even if there's not a lot of space if the um, developmentally toddlers need to move I mean we all need to move but toddlers really need to move so <clears throat> providing regular opportunities throughout the day for the child to experience movement um, in um, whichever way you know reasonable in their environment but also combining movement through 
interaction. So, the you know the old the games that we learnt to teach our children when our our kids were little. Um, mine was a long time ago, <laughs> but um, that you know those games that are very interactive that involve a lot of movement, things like Rockabye Baby and and Row 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 Your Boat and those sorts of games that are are really they're quite physical. Um, they're interactive. They're musical. They're joyous. So so um, interspersing throughout the day at times that it's possible those sorts of shared moments of movement and voice and pleasure that bring them bring carers and their children together in a in a joyous way and the the joy of it the movement of it and the interaction actually are very settling for a child okay fantastic and so for a a, a bit of an older child maybe a mm. primary school child yeah yep. um would you suggest if they're getting outside or what other sort of activities might they yep. be able to do? Yep. Um, so this is where um, the it, it, developmentally, because a child at primary school has got very different skills from a toddler. So uh, at this stage, the, the child is really, um, really want acquiring mastery of skills. And there's an absolute buzz in a child when they've actually achieved something. So, so, uh, and there's also a, a real buzz in being able to plan an activity and achieve and and feel like you've, you've you 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 know you're kicking goals. So this is where um, doing activities that are at a higher order level, really, in terms of, um, and even if the kids are a bit sedentary, don't want to do anything <laughs> much, um, the the physical activity of walking, something as simple as walking down the street with their parents and observing all the bears in the windows and the rainbow drawings and the crayons on the on the floor or doing their own rainbow drawing crayons on the pavement um, the the basic act of participating in walking apart from anything else um, which ha has a number of benefits but but essentially it's actually getting outside being within nature whatever nature looks like in people's environments observing outside, looking outside themselves and being with, with others they love while they're doing that. So it's something I've certainly observed in my own community through COVID-19 that I'm um, walking my dog, you know, all these mums and their kids walking at all sorts of different times of the day and then saying that's their movement break. The kids love it because they don't get that chance to talk with their parents or their carers actually like that most of the time because lives are just so crazily busy. Yeah, so that's yeah. a basic, obviously a basic thing, but I think the main thing for carers and for families is not is doesn't need to be sophisticated or complicated or expensive. It can be really simple, but the simple activities of being with another person, enjoying the moment in nature, and 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 keeping your body moving. That's, that's it's very important because it's rhythmic, it's bilateral, as in cross body. Yeah. Um, you're t you're using all your senses in that experience of being outside. It doesn't mean to say you have to be outside, but it's a, if possible, it's a far better place to be because you're getting the natural environment around you and all the, the wind and the temperature and all those other lovely things that for most primary school children, actually learning that opportunity just to stay still in their bodies and to enjoy that with their families is very simple but quite profound. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and so... I'm guessing that that mastery uh, buzz continues uh, as you get a little bit older as well. Are there any activities that you would suggest for young people who are struggling to regulate their bodies and focus on schoolwork uh, who might be in early high school? Mm -hmm. well, look, this is also very much dependent on the child's um, sensory needs as well. So this, it's not, it's not one size fits all by any stretch of the imagination. So. Um, some children would be absolutely bored, you know, bored to bits by going for a, a walk because walking's far too slow, you know. So whatever whatever them uh, the intensity of 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 sensory experience they require, and they will know that because their bodies will tell them. So it's basically a matter of observing them observing themselves and their parents noticing what they need and their carers noticing what they need. So as the child gets older and the child is now, say, in, in early early high school it's tr it's interesting actually because you know many children that age are actually quite sedentary they're not meant to be developmentally in terms of what their bodies need but it's what they do because of our society really so it's in a way it's, it, it, it may not be the easiest thing in the world <laughs> to get some of our kids <laughs> moving away from the screen but if there's a possibility for a a, a shared activity um, with 
with their um, either SIBs or with their parents doing age appropriate um, activities that are um, enjoyable, but also quite uh, are physical. And I don't, I don't mean that you've got to be going to the gym all day in terms of having gym activities at home. I don't mean that at all. But, but mixing it up a bit with the, with the both the, the um, whether it be the using a, uh, the um, scooter or the um, skateboard, basketball ring. Um, and using facilities, like it's been interesting watching just around where I live in the suburb that where people seem to be taking turns a bit. Families are going up to the school grounds and using equipment for a bit and then they leave and then someone else seems to go up. So it doesn't look like, I don't know whether they've coordinated, I've no idea, but it's all being done within the social distancing rules, but it's giving the kids a chance to do those things, that that, that kind of mucking around stuff, not in an organised way, but just in a... Um, in a playful way and I guess I'm just emphasizing play here this it doesn't need in a way it's kind of it's kind of a novel thing for a lot of our children to actually have kind of free play time as opposed to structured group time within a context of a you know a, a club or whatever that's all really important but this other part's also very important yeah absolutely I mean ultimately we'd really like the caregivers to be having fun doing it absolutely absolutely yeah and, yeah and that's a great way to build the relationship between yeah. a caregiver and a child in a situation where they might not normally. Yeah. And I think one of the things that caregivers have <laughs> have, um, have almost been embarrassed at times when I'm talking with them about, um, you know, even wanting to do things that they like. Well, it's jolly good if they do things that they like as well because the kids are actually seeing a side of their carers, which is often quite young. It's quite playful. It's a bit silly sometimes. But that's actually delightful because it's they're really seeing the joy in their care is in, in joy in being with them is such a, a contrast to what a lot of our young people feel about their worthwhileness inside. So um, I guess I'm just emphasising that the not too, does, this doesn't need to be too um, sophisticated or complicated, um, but that doesn't make it any less profound and important. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think there's a lot of good ideas out there. For caregivers who want a bit more information or help, are there any um, places that they should look for additional assistance mm. or what else can they do? Uh, it kind of helps to have a computer <laughs> or, <laughs> or a, um, a smartphone or something because it, it it's not that easy because you can't even go to a library at the moment. Uh, well, you can online. You can do it online. But um, there are there's a huge number of resources out there. Um, and I think, and in fact, carers could probably learn a lot from the kids, actually, because the children are just, they just know where everything is. Um, some things they may not, you know, may not be in the best interest to know about where they are. But but just in terms of things like, for example, um, if, if people say I've got toddlers and they're wanting to and preschoolers are wanting to look at preschool activities, all they have to do really is Google online about preschool activities for children. And there's just this swathe of um, activities out there. It's like a recipe book, basically. Yep. And they can get on onto their iPad or whatever they've got at home if they've got one and actually pick and choose. Oh, I might do that today or, you know. Um, but what another thing, um, so that's kind of using using technology is is really important but even if some of the tried and the trues of um of adults own childhoods um this is actually a really good time for adults to be able to, to talk with the kids about well you know when we were young not in terms of glorifying our youth because it you know wasn't glorious at all but you know what I mean um but there are you know some of the elements of family life like the cooking together eating together reading together um drawing together and not not everything together of course because we well, you know we get sick to death of each other but but I think a combination of of what we find the resources that are out there there's masses of them it's just too many to even say you know and all many of the professional groups have got stacks and stacks of things online so you just have to look it up and do a bit of an explore uh, but also going back to some of the things that you don't get time to do the jigsaw puzzles that people do together board games together those sort of simple things that we just are really great fun and they really um the, the pleasure in them has never been lost yeah fantastic thank you very much tony is have i missed anything uh that you think is really important to include in this um i uh no i think i i'm 
I guess what I'm trying to do is really not to um, minimise how hard things are for people, but I guess what I've found over the years of working with children and their families and their carers is so many of the carers and families I work with are incredibly resourced in themselves. And I don't mean with money or, you know, um, um, all that stuff. I, I mean as, in, as, as a human being and actually really trusting their uh, intuition and um, and and talking with the young people and, and being a little bit, trying to be a bit more confident about themselves because what they have to offer, and I find this over and over again talking with caregivers about the children they look after, is, the, is their insights, their observations, their self-awareness um, and their hopes for the future for the children kind of are the, are the like the, um, the solace, you know, for these kids. And it's not idealising it at all, but to never minimise the skills they've got. Absolutely, absolutely. And I guess just to be kind to yourself and absolutely. tomorrow is always a new day. Absolutely. And, and you're going to have your bads and your ups and your, <laughs> your, try, your highs and your lows. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And also, sorry, can I just ask, sorry, Jen, the other thing I was just going to say is that um, to never think that their, um, their uh, anxieties about things are too trivial to share with their workers. So, you know, workers are busy, families are busy, but, you know, it's the reaching out, in a way, the reaching out to your case manager, et cetera, is actually really good modelling for the children because so many of our kids have not learnt to reach out. They've learnt not to reach out. So actually seeing that demonstrated to them and seeing how adults work together and how adults work as teams uh, and there's unity in that, seeing that uh, that the observing that in real life is a really powerful message for the kids that yes you, you know that mum or um whatever they call their foster carer she looks a bit gripey today and she's rung up a friend for a cup of tea and a chat and that's actually good you know she's she's a bit snarly but you know she'll get over it you know or he'll get over it whatever it might be but but actually that modeling of of reaching out seeking and and receiving help and that expressing vulnerability and that that being a really worthwhile thing to do and that doesn't devalue you or your integrity. I think it's very important. I think they're very wise words. Thanks so much, Tony. And um, we'll speak another time soon. Okay, thanks, Jen.